Thanks so much for tuning in to RU Recovery this week. It brought me back to this understanding of discipleship. But for God Almighty, rings loud and clear with salvation's gospel. What does gospel mean? This is the faith of every single person. I remember the night that I got saved. With him, gospel means good news. My church, and every time I looked at it growing up, I always got chill. And nevertheless, I live. So if you have your resource guide, get it out. Get ready to take some notes. Um, and let's dive right in. As we have went through this first chapter of Nevertheless, I Live, it has focused intensely on one person and one person alone, Jesus Christ. Why is that? That is because he is the most important person to your recovery process. If you forsake him, you cannot have access to God. That is what the Bible says. You can't get help from God because you just pray enough or do enough things that are good or help enough people. There's only one person that allows you access to God. He stands at the door and he stands at the gate and he only allows those who come by him into access to the Father. All those who would try to get in some other way meet failure. So there's only one way, one truth, one life, and wants to die. Only one way to the Father. There's only one truth that leads to Him, and there's only one life that you should be focused in on. Last week, we focused in on that one life that we have to be focused in on. This week, that last part of this title's chapter, Wants to Live, Wants to Die, that chapter name, it rings loud and clear with salvation's gospel, with the gospel of the Bible. What does gospel mean? The gospel means good news. Now, throughout this entire series that we've went through, as we went through the chapter one, you may say, man, it sounds like you've talked a lot really about Jesus and the gospel. And that's the way I really feel. But maybe you haven't perceived it that way. Today's lesson is the last lesson of chapter one before we move on into chapter two. And it ends with a salvation message. The Bible says and if in Hebrews chapter nine, verse 27, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Letter A in your resource guide, if you're following along, this life will end in judgment. Now, this verse Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 was a verse that was posted uh, in a bathroom at my old church. And every time I looked at it growing up, I always got chills because it was this sense of reality. It brought me back to this understanding of one day I'm going to stand before God Almighty and give an account for the life that I have lived. And make no mistake, this is the fate of every single person. You will stand before your maker and give an account for the life that you have lived. It's not something that would just go away if you don't think about it. Oftentimes, I would lay asleep on my pillow knowing I wasn't saved, and I would fear greatly because I knew, what if I die today? And I want you to think, is that your understanding of life? Is that your fear? Are you uncertain about eternity? The Bible says that these things are written that you may know you may have eternal life. You can know today if you would have eternal life. You don't have to think. You don't have to wish. You don't have to guess. But you can know today if you will spend eternity with Jesus Christ and with God. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 the Bible says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. This is trying to get people to understand. Jesus was wanting them to understand that, listen, you think you've done these things in secret, but your Father who knoweth everything sees all. One day you will give an account of the words that you have said. You will give an account for your life. Often the first thing that has went through my mind is, wow, that's going to be a long time. 
You mean I have to give an account for everything? Yeah, you have to give an account for everything. There will be plenty enough time. Remember, it's eternity. It is a timeless time. There will be plenty of time because time will be no more. It will take as long as it needs to take. Um, and this is what God is trying to get us to understand through his scriptures. In Romans chapter 14, verse 10, it says, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every man may, every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So we read in these scripture verses that there's going to be a day of judgment. And in the Bible, the, the Bible actually refers to two judgments. It refers to the judgment seat of Christ, where the righteous will stand. And then it refers to the great white throne judgment seat. This is the judgment for sinners. This is the judgment for those who have no righteousness, who do not have the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to their accounts, who are standing left alone with their own works, with their own deeds, and the books will be open and those things will be told and it will be told how they did all this wickedness. They, Yeah, they tried to do some good things, but they were sinners. They didn't have the blood of Jesus Christ to cover their sins. And then God Almighty will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Depart into the second death. Prepare yourself for the devil and his angels. Go to a place that I've prepared for the devil, the one who has rebelled against me for all of time and whom is suffering at this very moment. That is the great white throne. But the judgment seat of Christ, that is where those who have had their sins washed away, who have had Christ's righteousness applied to their account, is where they will stand and they will give account, not of the things that they did wrong. Praise God. That was a fear of mine. Oh no, everyone's going to see all of my sin. Praise God. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk in the truth and not in the darkness. That is an amazing thing. We don't have to pay for any of our sin. Believer in Christ, your sin is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is covered. Not only has your negative bank account been wiped out, so to speak, but righteousness has been added to your account. It's an amazing thing. It's something that is the what is called the joy of your salvation. You don't pay for your sins. Jesus Christ paid for all of them. What is the judgment seat of Christ? It's a judgment to see what it is that you did for Christ. We have to understand that the judgment seat of Christ is a time of reward and loss. Not loss in the sense of going to hell, but a sense of loss of your reward. Everything that we did for Christ will be run through the fires of God, the Bible says. And some things will be hay, wood, and stubble, and they will burn to ash, and we will suffer loss. But things that we did with our motives toward God, things that we did in the right way because of our love for God, not because of selfish motives, but we did them in the spirit of God, these things are going to come out in rubies, uh, sapphires, precious jewels, gold, silver. There are things that are reward for us. That is the way the Bible determines it. Now, I don't know if that is the understanding that we're going to get gold, silver, and rubies. But we need to understand that it is referred to that because it is just as precious. The rewards that we will get for doing the things for God in the right ways, um, these things are compared to the gold, silver, rubies, precious stones, that sort of thing. So have that understanding. But know that, Christian, the things that you do for God are not in vain. And know, sinner, that hasn't accepted the blood atonement for your sins there is a judgment coming. We have to understand this and take it seriously. If you're following along in your student resource guide, we're at letter B. The life that God wants you to live is free and obtainable through belief in God's Son, Jesus Christ. And John chapter 3, 
very famous passage, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, Jesus gives him an illustration of what you must do to be born again. It says in verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the servant, the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, what is this talking about? This is referring to an Old Testament passage where Moses, he made a bronze serpent according to what God wanted them to do. And he made it, he lifted it up, and God said, if they will believe in me, if they will turn to me for their salvation, if they look upon the serpent, then they will be healed. But if they don't want me, if they will refuse to repent from their sin and follow me, if they will not look upon this this serpent in belief, then they will perish. And that is exactly what happens. And Jesus makes that illustration to Nicodemus. He said, if you will believe on the Son of Man who's come to die for your sins, if you will believe on this work that he has done for you and take it as your own, then that is when you can have eternal life. It says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse number 16, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world just to condemn the world, but that through the son he might save the world, the Bible calls it. The Bible says and refers to the son of God being sent as a savior, not a condemner. It is not that just because Jesus came to the world, he came to condemn everyone. It means that he is the lifeline the rescuer, and you as a sinner on your way to hell need rescuing. You need to be saved as a drowning man needs to reach out for the lifeline. Jesus is the lifeline. He comes into the world to save those that would reach out and take him. And in order to be saved, you must simply believe. And as I ever talked about in the previous lessons, this is not easy believism. This is not just say a prayer and you're automatically saved. This is real belief that translates into a real relationship with Jesus Christ. This is real repentance. In letter C, if you're following along, it says, Believe in your heart that Jesus died to pay for the penalty of your sins. And three days later, he rose from the grave, defeating death. You must accept this gift as your own. I already read John chapter 3, verse 16, and then Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You have to accept him as your own. You don't get born into the family of God at birth. It is called being born Again, you didn't always have Jesus Christ. If that is your attitude, and you say, well, I've always had God in my life. I've never had to be born again. Then you are believing a false gospel. You are not believing the truth. And you are not saved, friend. You don't have Christ living in your life. Unless you can say, I've been born again. That is the fruit that says you have been saved. And because of that being born again, you're born into the family of God and it simply is made with the heart believing unto righteousness and the mouth making confession of that. That is my testimony. I remember the night that I got saved. With my understanding of knowing I was a sinner, I was lost, I had no victory in Christ, I had no relationship with Christ, I knew it and I believed on Christ Jesus for my salvation. And then I confessed with my mouth that He alone must save me. And I remember crying out to God. I remember the night that I got saved and I called upon God and I said, God, I don't have this relationship with you. God, I am wicked and I need freedom. And God, I want to have your salvation. I remember the night that I confessed before God that I needed him. That was the night that I got saved. That salvation is what every man needs in order to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Letter D, this belief in Jesus will save you from eternal life in hell and replace it with eternal life in heaven. As I said at the beginning of this, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. 
As the Bible clearly says here, you can know today if you have eternal life. It's not a guess. It's not a wondering when you lay down at night. It is a knowing. I do have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I can know today. You must simply believe and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Take him for your salvation. That's what makes you a Christian. Not doing works, not going to church, not reading a Bible. It is that relationship between you and your God by faith and faith alone. It's not relying on the sacraments. It's not relying on the priest praying over you. That is not what makes you a Christian. In the theological sense, what makes you a Christian is the fact that you are saved by grace and by faith alone in Jesus Christ. It is he who gives you salvation. Remember, it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. What judgment will you stand at? Will you stand at the judgment seat of Christ? Or will you stand at the great white throne of judgment and pay for your sins, yourself in a lake of fire and an eternity of hell? God is not condemning you. He is trying to save you. God is not sending people to hell. You are on your way to hell. And that is the repercussions, the consequences of the life of sin that you live. God wants to save you. Will you take his salvation today?